for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today we discuss the Leader Summit on Climate hosted by President Joe Biden in Washington. President Joe Biden has kept his promise relating to climate change. On the very first day as president, he returned to the United States, returned to the Paris Agreement. He appointed a special negotiator, a special envoy, former Secretary of State John Kerry, to deal with the issue. He held certain meetings in different countries, including India and China. And then he called a meeting of important countries concerned with climate change. It was held in Washington on 22nd and 23rd April. The consultations and the discussions showed that there has been an evolution on the thinking on climate change since the Paris Agreement. As you all know, the Paris Agreement had decided that every member country of the United Nations must make a de declaration of the greenhouse gas emissions reduction that they are willing and able to bring about. And on that basis, the United Nations was supposed to consider the offers and come upon, come to see whether this is adequate to meet the climate change problem. But now it's a slightly different approach. Now the approach is to ask every country as to when it can become a carbon-free economy. This is by way of persuading all countries to fix a target for, for a zero carbon situation in each of these countries. At the moment, the only country which has accomplished is our neighbor Bhutan. So the president himself took the lead in saying that the United States itself will be carbon free by 2050. And uh, reductions will be carried out on a, a sta stable manner, on a continuous and steady manner. And the expectation is that the United States will be totally carbon free by 2050. So he has just set an example by making this promise and is trying to persuade other countries to follow suit. So instead of like Paris Agreement, instead of just asking people to give the amount of carbon which they can reduce over a period of time, you set a target, a framework, and work towards it. And that they thought that would be a good way to deal with this. The participants in this conference or this uh, summit were basically the US held major economic forum on energy and climate, plus some other countries which have shown climate leadership, strong climate leadership, especially vulnerable to climate impact, and those who have shown innovative pathways to reducing carbon. A few members of the business and civil society were also invited. So President Biden said that he would, he, he pledged that US would reach zero emission by 2050, as I said, and also reduce emissions by 50% by 2030. So two figures, one by 2030, what would be the reduction that they are able to bring about and when it will be able to uh, eliminate carbon dioxide emissions. And for that also you fix a date. 
others followed. Brazil, for example, who was once considered to be a second Trump in the matter of uh, climate, pledged that illegal deforestation will be reduced by 2030 and uh, carbon neutrality would be accomplished by 2050 like the United States. Japan promised a reduction of 46% by 2030. Originally, it was only 26% that they had ind indicated and net zero by 2050. Canada similarly said 40% to 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. So these are generally countries which are close to the United States and they may have agreed on this even before they came to the summit. Russia, slightly different approach. They said they would significantly reduce emissions in 30 years. They have not given any figures. China is very significant here because like you know, in the Paris Agreement, the change that took place of voluntary emissions came as an agreement between United States and China. So John Kerry was in Beijing and after their consultations there, there was a joint statement uh, saying that both sides were committed to uh, the reduction of greenhouse gases. And China said that they would reach peak emissions by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. Of course, the uh, commitments made in a joint statement uh, were not fully uh, satisfactory because soon after the meeting, both John Kerry and the Chinese said that they had apprehensions about the commitment of each country into this particular agreement. So, so U.S. has now decided that they would work towards this. Israel and Korea talked about reduction of coal uses, but they did not mention any particular commitment. So the whole question is whether these commitments or these offers or these pledges would lead to any difference in the situation in climate. For example, let us take the United States. If the United States has to fulfill the pledge that they have made, they will have to make many changes drastically. And that has been the problem with the United States because their industry, their economy, their business leaders have all, always been saying that if they make considerable reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, the leadership of the economy of the world will dwindle. So this is the challenge that they have. They need to change policies drastically. They have to replace millions of uh, gas using cars, cut down coal use, then rules limiting to fossil fuel um, use will have to be also uh, reduced. And for that, you need, they need new technology. So all these situations considered, it is not considered realistic for the United States to acquire this kind of a situation. And this, I suppose, apply to other countries also. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who participated in these discussions, took a slightly different line. He did not provide any new targets for either reducing emissions or for completely eliminating greenhouse gas emissions in India. But he pledged to install 450 gigawatts renewable energy by 2030. So that is one way of saying that by reducing by or increasing renewable energy, we may be able to manage without cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Because the whole, whole debate is 
whether the developing countries can cut greenhouse gas emissions without losing their economic growth. So what he is suggesting that he is not suggesting that we will reduce emissions. He is saying that we will create sustainable lifestyles and renewable energy by 2030. And he also said that these kind of targets are not realistic unless the developed countries go back to sustainable lifestyles. They have to reduce their consumption, conspicuous consumption. And he also made an important point that the guidance of the philosophy of back to the basics should be adopted in the sense that there have been several agreements reached in the past. As we move along and change our direction and change our targets, we should not forget the basic agreements that uh, we had reached in the past. So the developing countries should have affordable access to green finance and clean technology. And he also pointed out that the grave threat Climate change continues to be a grave threat at the time of the pandemic. While all of us are greatly involved in dealing with the pandemic, the climate change threat has only been increasing. And therefore, he restated some of the principles that are necessary to be adopted, like funding, like technology, etc. And without reducing greenhouse gas emissions, by creating new technology in order to use renewable energy, developing countries may be able to reduce their emissions. So he did not follow the pattern of the other countries, uh, but mentioned that we are also doing things which would uh, make India reduce its greenhouse gas emissions or reduce its carbon output. So, what has happened in the Washington summit is a, is a new approach to the whole problem. And we know the long journey on climate change starting from 1972 in Stockholm, then where Mrs. Gandhi raised this whole question of the linkage between development and the environment. Then 20 years later, uh, the Conference on Environment and Development, which was held in Rio de Janeiro. And that was the, really the golden period, I should say, of uh, climate change negotiations, when some very important principles were laid down. Like the principle that all nations have common but differentiated responsibilities, indicating that some countries have more responsibilities than the others, because they are the ones who have used the resources of the world indiscriminately. So the recognition that the developed countries should do more, and developing countries must continue to develop themselves, is a very significant principle which was adopted in uh, the Rio de Janeiro conference. There was also an agreement that when we talk about emissions and when you calculate them, these emissions should be calculated on a per capita basis. For instance, a huge country like India or China, the emissions may be bigger because of the bigger populations. But if you divide per head these emissions per capita, then you will find that India and China are far below the other, the developed countries. For example, in the United States, is, if it is 11 tons of carbon per individual, India and China may be only three or four tons of carbon emissions. So these were some of the fundamental uh, agreements which had reached in Rio de Janeiro. But we know that gradually, the developed countries had moved away from this. And that is why in um, the first COP itself, first Conference of Parties, in Berlin itself, the developed countries began arguing that they will not do much about this 
and as the major emitters of the developing among the developing countries must also accept mandatory reductions this was not acceptable to us and we maintained that position in berlin in 1995 which led to the kyoto protocol in 1997 but the great crisis came when the kyoto protocol followed the decisions of 1992 of rio de janeiro the developed countries refused to accept that many countries including the united states refused to accept the kyoto protocol and they wanted renegotiation of all these principles and that is where the big break came about if the rio principles were followed as it was decided in kyoto and if that protocol was adopted the story of the climate change would have been different but the developed countries changed their tactics and they wanted to get out of this idea as mandatory emission cuts for the developed countries and that is what resulted in the very controversial decision in copenhagen in 2009 in copenhagen what happened was people started feeling that if something was not done something was not changed the kyoto Pro- protocol will not be implemented and therefore this whole exercise done till then would be wasted so five major countries sat together including our prime minister dr manmohan singh at that time and they devised a new strategy which was called the copenhagen understanding and this was done by a, small, a few countries most of the developing countries were not involved in it but india accepted this approach because we felt that if we did not agree to that nothing would be done so an agreement was reached that instead of a reduction of emissions either mandatorily or by compulsion or or by persuasion let everybody do emissions control voluntarily this was a dramatic change in the approach instead of the developed countries having mandatory cuts and developing countries not having mandatory cuts everyone would have voluntary cuts and this was the agreement which was reached in copenhagen but when this announced this was announced to the general body of the conference there was huge protests most developing countries walked out of the conference and countries like india china brazil united states were accused of changing the pattern that was established in rio de janeiro but in actual fact what happened was the the copenhagen understanding was a creation of secret negotiations between the united states and china and when they presented it there the other countries like india brazil also accepted it and that is how the copenhagen understanding came about so it took a long time for this um, solute solving this problem uh, because most developing countries were totally against it but over a period of time a new agreement was reached and so and that is the agreement that is known as the paris agreement of 2015 so i mentioned this long journey uh, because very important changes took place in the approach of the countries the world to uh, emission control so meanwhile we also got to know that the situation was getting worse and worse and the danger arising out of global warming and climate change was coming nearer so on the one hand there was a compulsion based on scientific evidence for something to be done and on the other hand developing countries asking for an equitable formula an equitable regime which all of us could adopt so paris agreement the fundamental position that paris paris agreement took was that it is very important to make sure that the global temperature 
should not go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. If that happens, then you cannot reverse the climate change that's already set in. So this was the target. The target was fixed in Paris. But the essential thing that all of us have to ensure is that the global temperature does not go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the voluntary figures were collected. All countries gave their figures. And the United Nations calculated the impact of that change. And they found that even if they were all implemented, the warming, the temperature will go up by something like 3 degrees Celsius, which means Paris Agreement is of no value. And this is what President Trump said, but he said it differently and therefore it was criticized. But everybody knew that unless something drastic was done to the Paris Agreement, the climate change cannot be reversed. So from 3 degrees Celsius, we all have to come down to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the mechanism there was that after five years, all countries will review the commitments they have made and will make adjustments so that we can bring the temperature down to 1.5 degrees Celsius or below. So this was the concern that was being considered in various fora. And what President Biden has done is to bring in this new element of not merely telling them voluntary cuts of a limited quantity to set a framework for final solution. This sounds better because they are saying that, you know, there'll be carbon brief by 2050, half carbon by 2030, etc. They sound very well. But what is the process? How do they reach that? Is it realistic? Is it also fair to ask the developing countries also to set this kind of framework when they have tremendous need for use of energy, conventional energy, which is available to them. Countries like South Korea or India, China, they all have huge coal deposits. How do we avoid using coal, for example? And how do you substitute it with other renewable sources of energy? So this question still remains. So this whole decision of the summit in Washington or the pledges made by the various countries will now be taken to Glasgow, where the next conference of parties will be meeting this year in November. So here we see that the same kind of process, like in Copenhagen, a kind of agreement reached among a few countries, and then that is sold to the rest of the world. And then if that is inadequate, then they look at yet another approach. So that is what the Washington summit has done. They have, many of them have given the pledges and the idea is to take this as a model and other countries should also give pledges. And that is why our prime minister did not go into that issue at all. He simply said that I'm going to increase my renewable energy sources, which means automatically that much less of carbon will be consumed in India also. But he pointed out very clearly that setting these targets and making these pledges may not be sufficient unless we go back to the basics, go back to the principle that uh, um, carbon dioxide emissions must be controlled by the developed countries by changing their lifestyles, by changing their habits, using of air conditioners, cars, the so-called 10 cents per gallon economy that they have developed in these countries. And they are showing no concern for that. But they believe that they can achieve this through new use of technology. 
So when the whole conference is held in Glasgow, the developing countries will be faced with this compulsion, as it were, of making the same kind of pledges. And they are not likely to like India has given an indication. China is not doing that. China is willing to give some indication of uh, conclusion of it by 2060. So they are closer to the United States. But the large majority of the countries will be on the side of India, which will demand action by the developed countries in terms of financing, in terms of technology, in terms of change of behavior. In other words, climate justice, about which our Prime Minister has been speaking about. So between now and November, I think a tremendous amount of pressure will be exerted on developing countries to come round to these kind of pledges. And that is what we, we have to see in Glasgow. There again, pressure will be on us to do something because developed countries will say that we stick to our vision of 2050 and 2060 and 2030, etc. And therefore, the developing countries should also do that. So whether they will accept that, whether it will be materialized, like in the Paris Agreement, and a new kind of Glasgow Agreement will be formed, by which the targets will be enshrined in them. That in an agreement, it will ask each country to make a commitment. And that is what US and China and uh, uh, some other countries like Japan, Canada, and even Brazil are planning to do. But uh, the Prime Minister's note, our Prime Minister's note was not of dissent, was very significant, though it was not discussed, because each leader merely put forward his views and there was no discussion because everything was online also. So this is where we stand after the Washington summit. So between now and November, many consultations will be held. Mr. Kerry will travel to many more countries and try to persuade all countries to establish some kind of a, a target. And then fortunately, even if these targets are set, there is no guarantee that will be formed. And therefore, again, we may go back to the Paris situation where the action taken is not adequate to meet the targets. Whether we can reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase by doing not is the test. Meanwhile, the pandemic itself is, of course, uh, a, a kind of symptom of the climate situation in the world. And that is something which people are tackling, very difficult situation. Almost all countries are affected by it because the focus is not on climate change, but on the pandemic. So simultaneously, two challenges have to be faced by the, all the countries in the world, particularly the developing countries. So Washington summit, maybe it has opened a new era of negotiations. But we cannot in all conscience say that this is likely to lead to any kind of solution. This is an initiative honestly taken up by President Joe Biden, but the reality of the situation has to be taken into account and no false hopes should be raised. Thank you very much.